uh, routing the dynamics that he's still working out analytically. It's become an historical yes. text already right. by chapter 25, but it's, it's the, the history uh, now comes to uh, abet the analysis yes. after chapter 25. I read somewhere that somebody had suggested that, you, that, that, that capitalism, the capital as a book should be read backwards. That you start with the last part, which is the origins of capital, you then come back into the general law of capital accumulation. You then come back and, you, and actually you could, you could read it backwards. And, and, <laughs> and I think, I think but, but, but in a way, that's also what I started out by saying, that, that actually you really understand the text when you get to the end, because you understand its historical foundation when you get to the end, but you also see that the theoretical apparatus that he's been utilizing just didn't come from anywhere. It was actually constructed in relationship to that very specific uh, kind of history. And, and I've never actually done it, but I, one of these days I'm going to try and teach it backwards and just see what happens, how, how people understand it, how I would understand it differently by, by beginning with the chapters on primitive accumulation and working, working backwards through the text. Well, it would be an incredibly optimistic thing to do because on the one hand, you'd think it would allow you to deconstruct the history, um, and yet it could also be optimistic from a capitalist point of view if you accept the history and say, ah, the commodity. Yes, you yes. Finally you come get, out with, you get, this you get, is what we're yes, really we, you after. You get back to the fetish, you know, that, uh, yes, exactly. that's what, we, that's what we, we, we are about. Maybe three things this week. Uh, first, to congratulate you having read the book. Uh, secondly, to uh, go over uh, a little bit uh, what you got out of it and, and uh, any kind of problems that you might have. Uh, but I wanted to start out with uh, uh, my own kind of uh, review a bit about where the book has been and where it, where it's going to, so that you can get some sense about how the formulation that uh, Marx sets out in volume one of Capital is in fact a beginning point for a much broader analysis. And I want to identify what some of the problems are that are latent within even volume one of Capital, which uh, are going to be elaborated on later, but which you may wish to think about. Before I do that, I want to remind you that the primary purpose that I think Marx has here is an ideological one, uh, which is to undercut entirely the Smithian argument that perfectly functioning markets will take uh, all varieties of human aspiration, greed, and whatever, and through the hidden hand, actually create a result which is to the benefit of all. And what Marx does, of course, as I remind you in chapter two, is to accept the Smithian formulation of a world uh, which is made up of uh, individual entrepreneurs, uh, characterized by private property rights and reciprocity and market exchange and no coercive relations between them and juridical individuals, as he says. And then to show, sort of step by step, uh, that the consequence of this uh, is not going to be to the benefit of all. There are two consequences. One minor, the other major. The minor consequence in chapter 25 is that if, even if you start out with a highly dispersed decentralized market, you're going to end up with centralized uh, motion of capital and that uh, therefore we're going to get a centralization of uh, economic power, an increasing centralization of capital. So that even if we started out from that position of competitive markets, the markets themselves over time would destroy 
uh, that uh, competition in favor of oligopoly, monopoly control and the like. The second uh, major proposition is, of course, that the class benefits will be chronically maldistributed, that is, the class that controls the means of production will make out like bandits from this system, whereas all of those who are producing the value through their labor power as wage laborers will be losing from the system, and that therefore you will get increasing inequalities uh, of class power. Now, Marx's prediction on that, of course, is contingent, as I want to remind you again and again on a number of assumptions about, well, there's no problem in finding a market for your goods, uh, there is no problem which arises from the fact that the capital is distributed into uh, rent, interest, taxes, profit on merchants' capital, industrial capital, and the like. So those assumptions are very important, including also the assumption that we're working in a closed system, which is not, uh, and that therefore there's no kind of imports and exports and, 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 and the like. But I think the central tale uh, that we get in capital is about what it is it what is it that capitalists actually do, and what is capital as a social system about? And I think if you wanted to simplify it to the point where you could actually consider that I'm being simplistic, it would be a simple story of this sort, which says that capitalists start the day with a certain amount of money. They go out into the market and they purchase two kinds of commodities. One is labor power. The second is means of production in which we would include raw materials of all kinds, intermediate products, energy, uh, fixed capital, machinery, and all the rest of it. And then what they do is that they choose a particular technology. And the technological choice, as we've seen, is terribly important. They choose a particular technology and put the laborers to work with the means of production to produce a fresh commodity. And this fresh commodity is then sold in the market for the original money plus a profit plus surplus value. So that's a basic, if you like, formula for the circulation of capital. Now the interesting question is, what happens on the day after the capitalists have done all this? What do they do with the surplus they got yesterday? Now if they are sensible people, they would simply consume it and have a good time. But, says Marx, there is something that stops them from doing that, and what stops them is what Marx calls the coercive laws of competition. That if my competitors start to reinvest a part of their surplus in increasing their output, and in increasing their capital, then if I do not do the same, then pretty soon I'm not going to be a capitalist anymore because they're going to drive me out of business, particularly if they start to invest in new technologies and, and all the rest of it. So the coercive laws of competition force the capitalists to take a portion of that surplus that they produced yesterday and put it into expanding reproduction, which means that on the second day they need more labor than they needed the day before. They need more technologies, or better technologies, than the ones they had before. They need more means of production relative to what they had before, and they're going to produce even more commodities than they produced last time around, which means that they're going to have to find even more of a market out there to sell their produce. And this system goes on and on and on, and you can see that if it was crisis-free, which is not, but if it was crisis-free, 
you would get a compound rate of growth in the accumulation of capital, in general. And actually, if you look at the, ha the, the, the history of capitalism, you do indeed see a tendency towards logistical growth rates, compound rates of growth. How fast, how much capitalists reinvest, they may, re they may invest everything they earned yesterday, they may reinvest only 70 percent or 60 percent, but they're almost certainly going to reinvest something. So this system then is, if you like, the way in which Bar Marx basically construes what a capitalist system is about. Individual capitalists, forced by coercive laws of competition, do not choose what they do, they're forced by system systemic considerations to engage in this expansion, therefore accumulation by accumulation sake, production for production sake. Now, <clears throat> let's reflect a little bit on that story that I've told, and let us sort of just simply set it out schematically. It goes, as I've suggested, like this, that we start with money. The money then splits into labor power and means of production. Money flows into this. With a given technology, you put it into production. You pr produce your fresh commodity, and you then sell it for the original money plus the increment of money. This then goes back in again to labor power, means of production, but a portion of this gets taken out into consumption of the capitalist, but a portion of it comes back and you need a delta labor power and a delta means of production. And it goes on and on and on in this way. It is a process so capital is construed as a process, remember, not as a thing, but it is a process that takes the form of things at different moments in this circulation. At this point it's money, at this point it's labor power and means of production, at another point it's the productive apparatus and the labor process that goes on there, or it's a commodity, or it becomes money again. So it has these material forms, but it is the flow of value which is, which is at work. Now, at this point we ask some questions about this system. Question number one is, where does the original money come from? Here's the first question. Where does the original money come from? And Marx's argument is primitive accumulation in the first instance. Primitive accumulation, which initially is founded on robbery, fraud, violence, total violation of all aspects of what a capitalist economy is supposed to be about. But it changes its character as you go on in time. When the bourgeoisie gets control of two vital levers in assembling wealth, and the first lever is that of the state, It either takes over a pre-existing state or it creates a state. 
which has juridical powers and can legally englo enclose the commons and do all those kinds of things, install private property rights, privatize assets and all the rest of it. So the state is very crucial. And the other lever in the whole thing is the credit system. And the credit system and the state are integrally connected e with each other through the public debt. So as time goes on, there are legal means by which this money can be assembled. And when you ask the question, how much money, you'll remember that in several points in Capital, Marx points out that you just can't start a business with five cents. For many forms of industrial production, you need a very large sum to break in. So there are what contemporary economists would call barriers to entry. And those barriers to entry depend upon the actual nature of the production process, how much capital you need to start up and all the rest of it, and start up your business. And to have enough, you need often to have centralized capital. And again, I don't know if you remember what one of the most powerful levers of centralization was in chapter 25. Do you remember? The credit system. Again, the credit system is in there, but we're not going to talk about that here, but the credit system is one of the most powerful levers of centralization, which distinguishes centralization from concentration. Because concentration would mean simply this, that at this point we started out with this amount of money in production process, at this point we've got a little bit more, and we go on a little bit more. So concentration of capital occurs over time as you take this logistical kind of growth rate push and keep it going. But centralization is something different. It's about large companies taking over small companies. Furthermore, it's also about further waves of privatization. And here I would add that when we ask the question, where does the initial money come from, we're not only going to be talking about primitive accumulation and what Marx calls the laws or tendencies towards the centralization of capital, we're also talking about those processes that I talked about last time accumulation by dispossession, <coughs> that taking away assets, that one of the ways, and again, one of the ways in which you can do this is with the help of the state and the credit system. There is a crisis of liquidity in Indonesia in 1998. Firms suddenly can't pay their bills, not because they're bad producers or they're doing anything wrong, but simply they've got caught in a credit squeeze. They have to declare bankruptcy. They go out of business. They have to sell very cheap. In comes big capital, buys it up, and they've got high value for rock bottom prices. This is accumulation by dispossession. Similarly, when you take away people's pension rights, or when you, again, force people off the land where they've lived for many years, this is accumulation by dispossession. And I don't know how many of you have been following what's been happening in West Bengal in recent months. There you have a Marxist Communist Party, which has been in power for 30 years, that's decided industrialization is the answer. Therefore it needs to dispossess peasants of their land. And they've violently taken the land away from the peasants, killing Nobody knows quite how many. When I left Mumbai last week, they just dug up another 20 or 30 bodies, killing the peasants, dispossessing of their land, in order to make way for large-scale Indonesian capital to start production in India. This is again accumulation by dispossession. So there are a lot of questions you would ask about where does the initial money come from? 
And some of these questions are answered in capital Vol. 1, but others, I think, need to be expanded upon. Who has the money? How much of it is there? What's the role of the credit system and the state in dealing with this? These are sort of big questions that call for further analysis, but you can see the way Marx has set this up, that these are the questions that naturally follow. And this process of assembling the money is problematic. And as you will also remember, Marx has his little joke with John Locke's theory of property, which says that, well, if you mix your labour with the land, then you're entitled to private property in the land, and kind of says, well, if you applied that to the labourer, then whatever you started out with here, after you've produced the surplus value out of exploiting the labourer, then after a certain period of years you've actually forfeited any kind of Lockean right to your private property, it should all go to labour. So this money power and this concentration of money <coughs> power, where it comes from and how it works, is if you like, problem one in the whole argument. The second problem point is where is your labour power? Not only now, but where is it going to be in the future? And assuring yourself of correct labour supply, correct quantity and qualities of labour supply is of course one of the big issues for how a capitalist class approaches the question of politics, particularly in relationship to state power. And <coughs> the whole labour question is of course fundamental in Volume 1 of Capital. Struggles over the working day, struggles over the wage rate, struggles over the conditions of production in the labour process. So there are a whole series of struggles which go on between labour and capital. And I'm not going to review them here because they're very much embedded in, capital, in, in what you've been reading and so you should be very familiar with it. But of course, one of the things you're going to have to remember is the argument in chapter 25 when Marx points out that actually capital is in control on both sides. The demand for labour and the supply of labour, how is that so? Well, through its selection of technology. So the technological selection becomes crucial in this particular class struggle. So there is a labour problematic. If capitalists cannot solve the labour problematic, then labour, if it is scarce and if it is powerful, is in a position to start to claim more and more of the surplus it itself has produced. And as it does so, capitalists are going to receive less and less of that surplus. And it may get to a point where capitalists, seeing that the surplus disappears, are likely to go on strike and refuse to actually circulate capital anymore and engage in either a massive collective lockout in the form of a depression, an organized, orchestrated depression, or simply a personal lockout by saying, I'm not going to pay you anymore. But if you cannot solve it, we get something which is a particular form of crisis. And this crisis is often called a profit squeeze crisis. And there is a whole kind of set of theories within Marx's arguments, within, within, amongst Marxists, a whole set of arguments to say that a profit squeeze crisis is likely to be the form of crisis 
which is going to stop capitalism in its tracks. And many people would point to the period from, say, late 1960s to the late 1970s as being characteristically a profit squeeze crisis. Labour, particularly in Europe, was extremely well organized. Political left-wing parties were not legislating necessarily in favor of capital, but were taking away large chunks of the surplus. So that the capitalists didn't have that much left. Social democratic states were doing that. Even in this country, labor was much more powerful at the end of the 1960s than it had been for a very long time. The Democratic Party was even prepared to pass anti-corporate legislation, such as environmental protection, consumer protection, occupational safety and health legislation, and all the rest of it. And at that point, the capitalist class found themselves under assault from democratic structures of governance that were siding more with the cause of labor than with the cause of capital. And there were serious effects on the assembly of wealth within the capitalist class itself. They were not doing so well. And also with the rate of accumulation. When you get into the early 1970s, you get stagflation. And so many people would say this was a classic profit squeeze crisis. The response to which, on the part of the capitalist class, was simply to somehow or other find a way of diminishing the power of labor. And this you could do in a number of different ways. One was a political assault against labor unions and their power. A political assault against social democracy. And in particular, against too much taxation. And finally, of course, an assault which said, well, you may be privileged where you happen to be located, but we're off somewhere else. We're on our way to Mexico. We're on our way to the Philippines. We're on our way, ultimately, to China. And even the threat of moving, at some point, is likely to discipline labor. So, there was, in effect, a fierce class struggle from the mid-1970s onwards, in which the capitalist class, in effect, set out to solve the labor problem, and the labor scarcity problem, and the too much power of the trade unions problem, as they like to call it. So this is, if you like, the second area of consideration, which is taken up in Volume 1. The third area concerns the means of production. Where are you going to find adequate means of production? And when you go back down the chain, you get back to the question of raw materials and the relation to nature. Now Marx does not deal with this at great length in Volume 1, but recall, at a number of key points he says, well, capital accumulation left to itself will destroy both the laborer and the soil will destroy both sources of all, of all wealth. And so the nature question, and the relation to nature, becomes rather significant. And over the last twenty or thirty years, there are many people who have suggested that this is actually a more potent source of crisis, even, than the labor question. That capital, having solved, if you like, the labor question via both state policies and state politics and 
offshoring and all the rest of it, and technological change and all the rest of it in the 1970s, was left with an eco-scarcity problem. Scarcity of resources. And this is what is sometimes called, in the words of, a, of Jim O'Connor, he calls this the second contradiction of capitalism. which says, at some point or other, capital is going to destroy so much nature that we're going to have a crisis which is going to be derived from the relationship to nature. That we're going to hit peak oil, or we're going to hit global warming, or we're going to hit all of these kinds of issues. So, there is another point where we have to ask a whole set of questions. Elaborate, if you like, on Marx's argument. He doesn't do it so much. He certainly does a lot on the profit squeeze kind of stuff. But we need to look very carefully at this kind of argument. Is it reasonable to call this the second contradiction, as opposed to the labor struggle as being the first contradiction? What happens politically when you start to emphasize the second contradiction, and argue as if the first contradiction is no longer relevant. And then, of course, you get, you know, the spotted owls versus the lumberjacks in the Pacific Northwest, and all sorts of problems of, of that sort. So, here too then, you have to look back down the chain and say, implicit in this simple purchase of means of production, is purchasing something which has its origin in a natural environment of some kind, from which you are extracting, and which you are modifying as you extract it. So there is a whole kind of dialectics of nature relation which is involved here, which is a potential source of difficulty. The fourth arena of consideration is about the technological mix which is going to be used in production. Now again, Marx has a lot of things to say about this in terms of the relative theory of relative surplus value. But you'll remember that technology here is not simply about machines, it's also about the software, the incorporation of intelligence into uh, machine-type production, the programming and all of those kinds of things. But it's also about organizational forms, cooperation, divisions of labor, and the like. And capitalists have some problems selecting a technology. Which technology do you select? And we've seen that it's advantageous to the capitalist class to have rising productivity in those industries producing wage goods that support the laborer. Because then, if there is rising productivity, the value of the commodities that the laborer needs to survive diminishes and the value of labor power declines. And as you will recall, it's possible for the value of labor power to decline at the same time as the material standard of living of labor is rising, provided there is very strong productivity gains. But that is not what individual capitalists are about. Individual capitalists are driven by the need to compete with other individual capitalists for a brief ephemeral form of relative surplus value, which gives them a particular personal surplus value relative to others but that disappears as the technology becomes more general. So there is an incredible driving force here. And to the degree that that driving force starts to eliminate labor from production, then you take away the major source of surplus value production. And from this technological dynamic, 
Marx and many others have derived another kind of theory of crisis, which attaches technological dynamism to falling rates of profit. I've indicated a couple of times that I don't actually believe in any simple version of the falling rate of profit argument. But what I certainly do believe in is that technological change has a destabilizing effect upon the capitalist dynamic. And it does so in all sorts of ways. For example, rapid technological change which forces you to change your technology every six months, is an extremely costly business. Particularly if a large amount of money is wrapped up in the technology and the old technology has to be thrown away and you haven't yet regained all of the value which you laid out for it. So there are many ways in which you can look at the technological dynamism question as one of the grand destabilizers of a capitalist economy, and therefore also a potent source for potential crisis formation. Where it comes, how it comes, we won't exactly know, but it is always a beginning point for these destabilizing effects which often have reverberative effects and grow systemically till the whole system falls down into crisis. <coughs> this then leads to this link, which is the fifth link. Now you recall the argument about when Marx is talking about MCM and all the rest of it. The argument was that it's much easier to go from money to commodity, i.e. the universal equivalent, to the particular, than it is to go from the particular commodity to the universal equivalent. And he, Marx suggests that there are many points at which this jump, if you like, is a real problem. But it's a real problem in an aggregate sense as well as in a particular sense. Because the aggregate sense is this. It says there must be more money in the system at the end of the day than there was at the beginning of the day. Who holds that more money? Where is that more money coming from? And in fact, if you can't find that more money, if there's no more money in the system, to buy the product, then you've got a crisis, because you're not able to sell your commodity, and you can't get the surplus value. There is, as the Keynesians would call it, a lack of effective demand. There is a different kind of crisis which forms around this, which we would call an underconsumption crisis. There is not enough money in the system to buy up the excess value that's being produced. Now many people would look at the 1930s and say this was an under-consumption crisis. This was a big, this was a big deficiency of effective demand. And that therefore, as Keynes said, it's up to public policy to solve that by using the state and using fiscal measures to try to stimulate the economy. In other words, using debt financing to provide the money. 
printing money, if need be, in order to keep the market liquid and to keep the whole system in motion. So the underconsumption crisis is also a possibility within this system. And there are those, from Rosa Luxemburg onwards, who kind of said, there's no way you can solve this internal to capitalism. Therefore, the only way in which capitalism can survive is through a, a form of imperialism which raids non-capitalist sectors, and in particular raids non-capitalist parts of the world, and she was thinking of you know, China and uh, the opium trade and all those kinds of things where the British sort of forced a certain kind of trade upon the Chinese in order to extract their silver, and having extracted all of their silver then that could lubricate the global system by increasing the supply of money into the global system on a perpetual kind of basis. Today we wouldn't do that so much, but obviously one of the big roles of credit institutions, of the Federal Reserve and all the rest of it, is to keep this thing rolling along so that if there is a deficiency of effective demand, find some way to stimulate it by cutting interest rates and all the rest of it. Here too, we have implicit in this system a whole set of questions which have to be resolved, which are partially addressed in Volume 2 of Capital, and to some degree in Volume 3. Now, it's interesting when you go and explore the Marxist literature. You'll find tremendous controversies over these three major, and let's add in a fourth, major form of crisis formation. And, you know, there are people who gladly and happily call themselves profit squeeze theorists. And everybody else sneeringly refers to them as profit squeeze theorists. Then there are the falling rate of profit folk, and there are varieties of that, for reasons which I think I've hinted at. There are the falling rate of profit folk, and considerable argument with, amongst them, but then also, you know, they're often referred to sneeringly by the others as the falling rate of prof profit folk. And the same thing happens with the under-consumptionist. I mean, People will kind of write a review of what you're writing, and you know, and because I quoted Rosa Luxemburg favorably, I'm immediately dubbed, oh, I'm an under-consumptionist. And of course that's meant that I'm a, you know, I don't, I don't understand my Marxian economics at all, uh, because nobody in their right minds uh, who has read Marx properly would ever dream of being an under-consumptionist. Now my argument here is this that actually you have to envision all of these moments, if you like, in the circulation process as potential blockage points. Blockage points which capitalist politics have to, have to remove and have to find ways through bypass or what. And that therefore there is a perpetual battle in capitalist society over all of these elements. And at any one moment, any, one of them can be, if you like, the core problem, but that doesn't mean the others are not in play. In fact, you can see very much when you're talking about the profit squeeze and the relationship of the demand for labor power to the technological choices, that in fact the kind of technological destabilizer can have an effect very strongly on labor power as it does also on these other forms of contradiction. So what it was always been interesting for me is to go through Marx's works and then see what he has to say about these different blockage points, and 
how he thinks that capitalism and capitalists can successfully negotiate past them and through them. And if they can't, then what you get is a stagnation in this whole flow. It can get blocked here, and if it's totally blocked here, then that's, that's it. Capital is in deep trouble. If it's totally blocked because of the relation to nature, capital is in deep trouble. If it's totally blocked because the technological dynamism has become so crazy that nobody feels comfortable investing in anything anymore, I mean, why would you invest in new machinery this year if you knew in six months it was going to be outdated? So the whole thing grinds to a halt for that kind of reason, or because there is not enough consumer demand at the end of the story. So, you know that any one of these blockage points can stop the flow. And since capital is defined as a flow of value, if you stop the flow, you've stopped capital. And capital gets lost. The result coming out of this is a crisis of devaluation. which is mainly signalled by the fact that there is surplus capital which is blocked and can find no place to go. And the blockage has to be relieved if you are not going to fall into a major crisis of the system and, in effect, capitalism will cease to work at all. Now part, it seems to me, of the whole history of bourgeois politics from the 18th century onwards is an intuitive re recognition of the importance of all of these potential blockages and the mobilization of intellectual power, think tank power, state power, and corporate and capitalist power more generally to make absolutely sure that these blockages don't occur. And that sometimes takes a lot of planning, a lot of hard work, and it sometimes does indeed take a good deal of violence. So that, for example, when Margaret Thatcher decided to crush the miners' union and crush the, crush the labor movement in Britain uh, in the 1980s, a good deal of police violence was involved against the strikers. And again, you will have seen that in American history, and you see it again and again and again in the histories of many developing countries. To be a trade union move movement leader in Colombia, or some country like that, is in fact probably to shorten your life expectation by something like twenty years. And so the violence that's involved at, the, at these points also becomes a very critical moment, and to the degree that the state is the source of that violence, uh, or simply tolerates that violence, then we have a political system which is dedicated to making sure that these blockages do not occur and we do not get a massive devaluation of capital as value simply gets lost because it's no longer in motion. Because capital which is not moving is dead capital and eventually not capital at all. And it is the motion, and the perpetual motion, which is critical. Now, I like this 
formulation because it allows me to think of all sorts of things and ask all sorts of questions. Like, where does the consumer demand come from? What is the role of consumer debt? What is the role of the invention of credit cards, ATMs and all the rest of it? What is the role of the state <coughs> in actually providing the kind of backup of purchasing power? What is the role of, for instance, the military-industrial complex? What is the role of a politics of fear, which has us investing in all kinds of security, you know, security apparatuses and the like? Military apparatuses, police apparatuses, what's the role of all of that in, as it were, promoting all of this? In my own work, for example, just recently I've been looking a lot at the whole kind of problem of where does the capital surplus go? You're perpetually producing it, where does it go? What what gets absorbed? How is it absorbed, and by what? And I find it fascinating when you start to look at the history of urbanization over the last 150 years. Much of it is simply about surplus absorption through urbanization and the transformations of lifestyle that have occurred. And I can go into that much greater detail later if you want. But clearly, to me, what happened in this country after World War II through suburbanization was very much about what a wonderful way to absorb the surplus. But that wonderful way to absorb, absorb the surplus meant all kinds of things like changes of lifestyle, changes of world view, changes, you know, all those mental conceptions and social relations and production apparatuses that we talked about uh, earlier on, all of those things start to change as the surplus gets diverted into urbanization. And it's very easy in these times to look at you know, this rhetoric about planet of slums and all the rest of it and not recognize that that is paralleled actually by an immense construction building boom that's going on and has been going on for the last five, ten years right across the world. China, Mumbai, Santiago, in Sao Paulo, New York, San Diego. Imagine where the surplus would have gone if you hadn't had this radical transformation of urban structures. And that has been going on for a good 150, 200 years. So that you cannot even talk about a question like urbanization without connecting it to this simple question of where does the surplus go to? And if it cannot go into urbanization, then where on earth can it go? And <clears throat> Some of it, of course, has been indeed going into the military-industrial complex. But where does it go? Well, those are, the, those, are the, those are the problems. So these are the issues, then, that come out of this very simple, simplistic story, as it were, of what capitalists do and what they're about. And in doing this, you start to see all sorts of connectivities, like it is very interesting to see when you look at the status of the credit system. The credit system plays a very important role in the assembly of the money in the first instance. You can even borrow non-existent assets and start production that way, using the credit system. But the credit system also plays a very important role in consumer demand. What a wonderful system. It's like when Marx talks about 
capital works on both sides, both the supply of labour and the demand for labour, it also works through the credit system on both sides. The supply of capital at the beginning of the process, the supply of money at the beginning of the process, and the supply of money at the end of the process. And a lot of what <coughs> fiscal and monetary management is about is precisely, it seems to me, calculating how the credit system can monitor both ends. And as we're seeing with the subprime mortgage crisis, it does it sometimes to the point where in order to prop up the demand it does all kinds of crazy things at this end, and then somebody says, what the hell's going on, and out, out it all pops that there's nothing there, and so we then get a retrenchment at the other end. So the credit system has a very interesting role to play, a very complicated role to play when we start to look at these relations. So you can use the argument in Volume 1 of Capital to start to project forward to where Marx is likely to go, and indeed he does follow up some of these issues very coherently in Volumes 2 and 3. But it also helps us understand a little bit about where were the places he didn't go, where we ought to go. For instance, I think it is correct to say that Marx did not pay enough attention to the relation to nature in its detail. He makes these comments periodically about capital will destroy the land, but we don't get any detailed analysis of exactly how crises of that sort unfold. We don't always get good analyses of the consumerist side of things either. And we don't have the kind of analysis of finance, capital, and the credit system that we really would need to have in order to be able to talk about how the system gets stabilized through state action and, and fiscal action and finan financial activities at the same time as you also, you also create another kind of crisis, which he has hinted at in Volume 1 of Capital, which says, you know, you can get a financial crisis out of this system. And he postulates the, that possibility. So there is, if you like, residing out here, a sort of overarching role of the credit system and the possibility of independent monetary, financial, fiscal, and state finance crises on the outside. So we should really put this uh, into the mix as well, but it's hard to do that very directly coming off the analysis in Volume 1 of Capital. Okay, now I suggested you take a look at uh, Chapter 1 again and maybe think about it a bit and all the rest of it. So if you have any kind of comments about uh, how you see it this time, or you want to uh, ask any questions about this, then, you know, fire away. It's uh, up to you what we talk about. Yeah. Thinking about the state, thinking about transitioning out of the capitalist <coughs> system into a, a newer system, an alternative system, um, into finding yourself into the state, whether, I wonder what Marx would think about in terms of whether the state could be seen as an ally in transitioning to that new system, is it more of an obstacle, and also what you would think of other models like say the Zapatista model where they don't seek to take over the state necessarily but just to create their own kind of base of power and they, they you know, control their own territory and are obviously creating their own alternative form and system. Um, so I'm just kind of, a lot of these things are dancing yeah. out of my head as far as how Marx would view the state and, and, and transitioning to a newer system, a different system. Well, uh, in order to answer that question, you have to ask a little bit about what is the role of the state uh, within a capitalist system anyway. Now, if you start to go through capital, you see uh, immediately, the state has an important role to play. First, as a guarantor of private property relations and of market institutions. Secondly, it has a very important role to play in terms of the monetary system and how the monetary system is set up and how symbols of money are constructed and all the rest of it. Um, thirdly, 
it has a very important role as, if you like, a central institution uh, through which the dynamics of uh, class struggle between capital and labor are worked out, as in the working day. Uh, fourthly, it has an important role, for example, in a chapter on machinery and, and industry in terms of the regulatory apparatus which exists, and, and finally it has a very important role in terms of managing labor supply and all the rest of it. In other words, the state has all of these kinds of roles which it's going to play, and the state system is set up uh, even around questions of education and so on. Uh, so those, 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 uh, those activities are very crucial to the way in which capitalism works. Now a question you have to ask is, well, could we envisage therefore a society in which there was uh, no state in control of, of the monetary system? Or no state guarantee of, for instance, rights of any sort? And here I think you get into a very kind of uh, curious uh, situation because, uh, you know, well, it's clear that Marx takes the view that, that we're, we're dealing with a capitalist state. He's also, I think, recognizing that you need some sort of organized political power to do anything. And in a way, to say that the Zapatistas are not organizing a, some form of state power, you know, is, I think from Marx's standpoint, would say, look, this is. This is a falsehood. It's different from the Mexican state, uh, but they have communes and they have, you know, and they have educational structures and all the rest of it, and they have a disciplinary apparatus and, and all the rest of it. So, you know, they're doing, they're, they're not sort of sitting there saying we have no organization at all. In fact, the reason they've managed to, to survive so long is precisely because they've had a, a form of organization, even a military form of organization. In other words, you could make the argument that what the Zapatistas have constructed is an alternative kind of state apparatus. And here you, you go back into the history of the state within capitalism, and it's never been a fixed entity. I mean, think of what the state did a hundred years ago and what the state is up to now. It's a very different kind of beast, if you want to call it that. And so I think that from, from Marx's standpoint, you would have to look at, well, what kinds of, what kinds of uh, apparatuses for coordination, for regulation, and so on? I mean, even from surveillance. I mean, the idea that you could have a state which had none of that, or you could live in a society where that, none of that existed, uh, and, and, and be talking about uh, uh, you know, cities which are 20 million people, I think you would kind of say, well, you know, that's, there's no way in which you can use the politics of a small rural commune of, of 100 people and say that somehow or other that apparatus can somehow or other work for Sao Paulo or for Shanghai or, or wherever. So I think that, that, that <clears throat> the issue here would be uh, to what degree is the state totally captive to bourgeois interests? And I think historically that has not always been the case. Uh, for example, one of the ways in which you can relieve capitalists of all of their anxieties about what to do with their surplus tomorrow is in fact to tax it away. And this is in effect what a lot of social democratic governments were doing. They were taxing it away. Now, I have to think the production of a surplus, to some degree, is not a bad idea. The big question is, who controls the surplus? And I think that the big wave of you know, neoliberalization since the 1970s has really been as much about the privatization of the surplus as it has been about the privatization of anything else. That is, stop the state taking away a big chunk of that surplus and keep it circulating around in such a way that now individual capitalists are in control of the surplus, or collectively in control of the surplus, 
rather than, than the state apparatus. And that control can then be used to sort of exercise increasing power over the state apparatus. I mean, I understand politically, right now, many people would regard social democracy of the 1960s sort as a sort of betrayal of revolutionary possibilities. And to some degree, it was conservative and conserving, and it was. But at the same time, when you kind of say, therefore, I don't want to have anything to do with the state, uh, what do you think the right wing says to that? What a great idea. <laughs> what a great idea. And in fact, a big chunk of neoliberalism has taken up a, ne a kind of libertarian rhetoric, which was left and taken it to the right and used it on the right. And we see exactly what that is producing. So the question of the state is a, is a, is a, is a very big one. Um, and there's a lot of argument obviously going on about it right now, but I think um, Marx's view of it would be that some sort of organization is necessary. <clears throat> Something like a state would have to be constructed. And interestingly, when you go to look at, uh, say, anarchist proposals about municipal governance and, and, and uh, municipal assemblies and all the rest of it, you've still got a whole set of questions of exclusion, inclusion, and many of the problems which you see in the state just simply get replicated again. So I think it's a false dichotomy to kind of say somehow or other you can do without something like a state. Now the question is who controls the state, what is the state apparatus really about, in what ways do we need to smash some arm of the state, like its militaristic and, and, and police arm, and do something different with it. So yes, but the state can be really radically transformed. And I think that uh, the point where it would wither away, as many people argued, and Marx argued also, I think he really was talking about the withering away of bourgeois control over the state apparatus. Which is not to say that working class control over the state apparatus is necessarily going to be the end of the story either. There has to be, as it were, complete uh, popular uh, control over the state apparatus in some, some way or other. In a, in a classless society you would need a different kind of state apparatus to that which we have uh, today. And of course in a, in a society in which uh, the role of private property rights is, is incredibly diminished, then indeed the role of the state would not be what it is now, because the role of the state right now is to protect those property rights. Uh, and if they're no longer terribly relevant, then obviously the state apparatus would be uh, radically transformed along with that. Yeah. Um, in the final section, there was the, the added chapter, the resultate, and there, the introduction was pretty good at explaining. But I wondered if you had anything to say about the material in there in connection to this, or in connection to the existing bond one, two, three, in any way? Uh, well, it's, it's an elaboration, a very, very interesting elaboration. So yeah, I think you know you should. You know, if you want to follow up, it's, it's a fair, per, fairly interesting read. There are uh, some elaborations, some reformulations, and so on. Typical Marx, he 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 sort of formulate something and then reformulates it, and so there's some reformulations in there. Uh, it's very well worth while reading. You get some extra insights from that in relationship to the capital. This is in fact a bit of a problem with volumes two and three and the theories of surplus value, that they're, they're, they're explorations. And since they're explorations, you'll find considerable differentiation in the way the formulations get, up, get, get set up. So you're dealing with an incomplete uh, kind of work, in other words, so you have to you have to mine it for its insights rather than look within it for some sort of coherent statement of the argument. Volume one of Capital is the place where you get uh, the lengthiest, <coughs> most coherent argument, because volumes two and three are uh, kind of collated bits and pieces, some of which are reasonably coherent in their own right, but you're not quite sure what the relationship is with others. And so it becomes a bit more of a jigsaw kind of puzzle uh, to figure out what Marx uh, was actually doing and what we should do with what he did in order to kind of synthesize it. 
Okay, it's uh, 8.30, so thank you very much for everything, and it's been a lot of fun. Okay? Thank you. Well, we've gone through 13 lectures on capital, and we've gone through it in a fairly direct and textual way. But maybe now, as we conclude, there's a possibility to broaden the questions out further. Are there concluding issues that you'd like to raise that maybe uh, aren't as tied to capital as a text, but maybe that there are broader questions that you think are pressing? and important for us to look at as a result of having gone through capital? There are two areas I would look at. Uh, one is um, the work that needs to be done to both update uh, his findings and to extend those findings into other terrains, like uh, you know, Neil has worked a great deal on issues of nature and urbanization. I've worked a great deal on questions of urbanization. Uh, we've both of us uh, been very interested in questions of uneven geographical development, which I think is also a very crucial kind of uh, arena. So there's an intellectual project that flows out of this, which is, which is to try to uh, take Marx's method take his findings and project it onto different terrains. And, and, and as we project it onto different terrains, do what Marx himself would do, which is to sometimes take yourself back to the beginning and reconceptualize some of the basic apparatus that you started with. So there's an intellectual project here, uh, which is actually, uh, you know, it's, it's very exciting to work on, actually. And, and it's very revealing. I mean, I, I think I, for example, uh, have a much better grasp of how urban processes work and what goes on in cities now through doing this kind of work uh, over 15, 20 years. But then there's another project, which is the political project, which is that, um, you know, we, we can't wait uh, to engage in political action until we've worked out all of the bits of theory that Marx didn't properly <laughs> cover, you know. I mean, we are faced with, with, with urgent business uh, right now. And what Marx does is to, I think, hold up sufficient of a mirror uh, to us that, that we can immediately start to think about different modes of, uh, of action. And I think that this is where uh, that obvious term which comes out of Marx's analysis, which is the notion of class struggle, comes back into play. And politically, one of the problems we've had, I think, over the last 30 years is that people have started to say, well, class doesn't exist, or class struggle is irrelevant, or... Now, on that point, I think what Marx does is to tell you politically that you're not going to get anywhere in dealing with this system unless you're prepared to engage in some kind of class struggle. Uh, what we need to do is to, is to consolidate what that might mean. And I think that Marx himself at the time, from his, in his own writings, wasn't very clear as to what this, this, this meant. But when po political action unfolds, then there is, I think, and this is what you get from him, there is a necessity to participate, a necessity to be engaged. Even if you don't know all of the theory, even if you don't know everything, you know sufficiently about the dynamics of the system as you know exactly that this question of class struggle is, is, is fundamental. Now people will immediately say, oh, well, you're trying to reduce the question of nature to class struggle, or you're trying to reduce uh, questions of sexuality and gender and race and all this kind of thing to, to uh, uh, to questions of class, and I think the answer to that is uh, no, that's not going on at all. Those are, there are struggles of that sort which are very, very critical and very important to engage in also. But look at something like the subprime mortgage crisis, and look who it's impacting upon most. It's heavily concentrated uh, amongst Afri African Americans, it's heavily concentrated on women, low-income women, and it's a class phenomenon. 
And it's amazing when you start to think of it, the number of places and times in which those categories completely overlap, including also with ethnicity and all the rest of it. So actually, what we have to do is not be frightened of the word class. I think there's a nervousness about class. When, of course, there's a very good reason why there's a nervousness about class is because ideologically the capitalist class, which is very easy to define right now, doesn't want us to think about class. And I don't know if you've noticed, but as soon as you raise any kind of big issue or, or somebody raises some big issue, the Wall Street Journal jumps up and down and says, ah, you want to talk about divisiveness of class struggle. As if to say, well, you know, we shouldn't be doing that. But this is seen as a divisive thing, and therefore, therefore, if you like, the one thing the bourgeoisie, and again, this is something that Marx teaches you ideologically, the one thing the bourgeoisie does not want you to talk about is the one thing that it is crucially engaged upon. First off, it's very hard to find out where the money is. We have data on everything else. They have data on us. They have, they have chips on us and you know, where we're going and all this kind of stuff. Can we find out where their money is? They always say, no, 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 we can't find out. But what the anti-terrorism stuff started to show was that they could find out where the money was if they really wanted to. They don't want to know. That is the one thing you hide. You hide where the money's coming from, where it's going to. You hide also a great deal about capitalist power, which is a class power, and how that class power works. Because that would mean that somebody would oppose it with a class power. So the one thing they're terrified of is class power. They're very delighted at things like identity politics. Now, I'm not saying identity politics is all wrong, okay? I'm saying they are delighted by multiculturalism, they are delighted by identity politics. The one kind of multiculturalism they don't want to hear about is class. The one thing they don't want to hear about at all. So what Marx teaches you is you've got to go to this. You've got to be there. Now, how we do it is a big question. And one of the things I've tried to raise is if there are class struggles going on around primitive accumulation and accumulation by dispossession, those have to be integrated with you know, traditional class struggles in the workplace. That's not always easy to do. And actually right now there's a lot of struggles going on against dispossession. And sometimes the traditional working class movement doesn't want to know about that. And sometimes they don't want to know about the traditional working class movement either. So the divisiveness around this question is something that seriously hurts us politically. And I think this comes out of Marx very strongly, that you've got to confront what the centerpiece of the problem is. And the centerpiece of the problem is that they are accumulating capital off your back. They're either doing it through dispossession or they're doing it by absorbing your labor and, and, and the like. So whatever they're doing, they're getting filthy rich while you are the ones who are going to suffer. And that cannot continue. And, and that what Marx is basically saying to us by holding up this mirror is, get with it. He growed us. He salta. Here's the ball. Now run with it. Create the class struggle. How to do that? Big question. But you've got to do it. And there's a necessity for that. And it's a necessity not simply for the working class, it's a necessity for, for humanity. Insofar as we have a decent civilized life at all right now, has everything to do with the dynamics of class struggle over the last hundred years or more. And the fact that we're not waging it so effectively right now is a real problem, and we've got to get out there and do it, and do it right.